Lord, we thank you that you are our shepherd, to know you as the good shepherd, to know that you will watch over us, you will care for us, to know that you will lay down your life for us so that we have truth, so that we have righteousness, so that we have relationship with your Father. Lord Jesus, this is, this is why we count it the greatest privilege of our existence to be able to call you our shepherd. And to know that we have you means that we lack nothing. Those who fear you lack no good thing. The lions suffer hunger and want, but those who fear you lack no good thing. So Lord, if, if we fear you this morning, whatever we lack is not a good thing. Whatever we currently don't have is not a good thing for us in this moment. And this is because we know that you are our shepherd and we have you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that truth and we thank you for that reality. And as we turn our attention to your word, we pray that you would continue to shepherd us, shepherd our hearts, shepherd our minds as your church, as your people, that we would be who you have saved us to be. In your name we pray, amen. Well, you may grab your seat, and I want to just prepare you. I've got some good news and bad news this morning. Um, bad news is we're not going to be in the Gospel of Mark this morning. Uh, but the good news is I got a secret up my sleeve. I found something else to teach, but it's in the Bible, so that's the good news. We're in the Bible, so we can still get to hear from God this morning. It's really exciting. Uh, but I, you know, I felt a little bit like Spurgeon. He always talked about um, the, the 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 perils of a non-expository ministry, and um, every time the preaching came up, he's just sitting there like wondering what he's going to preach next. And so he'd look at the text, and all these texts in Scripture would be kind of like raising their hand, "Pick me, pick me." And uh, for whatever reason, this this text was raising its hand pretty loudly, and I thought, "Man, I think I need to go dive into this text." And so, you know, I just want to begin our time in the Word by just even sharing with you um, how this is one of those texts that have just been so, so useful for me, helpful for me over the years. Um, It's a text that has regularly shepherded my own heart. And I I remember, um, you know, if you talk to experts, um, psychologists or whatever, uh, I've heard people smarter than me and wiser than me have said that you always dream when you sleep. Um, And I don't know that that's true, and I don't know that they could prove that about me. All I know is I remember a dream on an average of once a decade. So two dreams ago, 2002, which means I'm I'm due for one, probably within the calendar year. I can't wait. It's going to be exciting. 2002, I remember having this dream. I was in seminary, and the, the dream went like this. The dean of the seminary called me into his office, and in his inimitable way, he just said, well, Mr. Anderson, you have a, uh, we have a standard here, and you are not it. And he proceeded to kick me out of seminary. And so in my dream, I didn't wake up, it kept going. And in my dream, I remember going to my pastor and uh, just begging, it, if only I could just keep teaching the Bible study. And I, I, woke, up, I woke up in this panic uh, and it was so real and so vivid that I literally was thinking about, well, okay, what's life after seminary look like? And um, I'm trying to contemplate that. And I remember being very concerned about just simply being useful to the Lord. And I think being useful to the Lord is certainly a righteous desire. None of us want to be useless for the Lord. If you want to be useless for the Lord, there's another sermon for you. This is not that sermon. I don't imagine any of us want to be useless for the Lord. We want to be useful to the Lord. However, the desire to be useful can quite quickly uh, become an idol when we find significance in our usefulness, when we start to define how we want to be useful. A good and healthy desire for usefulness can manifest quickly the terrible motive of self-importance. And that really becomes the challenge when we think about our own ambitions and desires to please Christ and to live for the Lord and to serve the Lord. 
I've been helped and benefited over the years by a picture, a, a picture in my mind that came from something that Spurgeon said a long, long time ago. He said this, Consciousness of self-importance is a hateful delusion, but one into which we fall as naturally as weeds grow on a dunghill. We cannot be used of the Lord, um, but what we also dream of, personal uh, greatness. We think ourselves almost indispensable to the church, pillars of the cause and foundations of the temple of God. We are nothing and nobodies, but that we do not think so is very evident. For as soon as we are put on the shelf, we begin anxiously to inquire, how will the work go on without me? As well might the fly on the coach wheel inquire, how will the males be carried without me? Now, I don't think, you know, Spurgeon knew much about the Pony Express, but ever since I've read that quote, I've kind of pictured a wagon on the Pony Express. And of course, that wouldn't even have a wagon, but there you go. That's the, we're just mixing muddled metaphors here. And I've pictured a, a wagon out west carrying the mail and a fly on the wheel of that wagon thinking, well, if I don't go with this, how are the, how's the mail going to get there? And it starts to put things in proper perspective. I was also helped on the more of the positive side. If Spurgeon's quote was a help to me in a preventative side, Robert Murray McShane, the, the famous Scottish preacher, helped me on the positive side, and he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to Reverend Dan Edwards in 1840. Uh, Dan Edwards was a pastor, and he went to study in Germany, and he writes this letter to him, and he says, I trust you will have a pleasant and profitable time in Germany. I know you will apply hard to German, but do not forget the culture of the inner man. I mean of the heart. How diligently the cavalry officer keeps his saber clean and sharp, every stain he rubs off with the greatest care. Remember, you are God's sword, his instruments. I trust a chosen vessel unto him to bear his name. In great measure, according to the purity and perfection of the instrument, will be the success. It is not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hand of God. And that's exactly right. McShane nailed it. It's not strength. It's not intellect. It's not gifts. It's not resources. The secret to usefulness is your holiness. Your, your usefulness, quite honestly, is your holiness. I want to ask you to grab your Bibles and open up to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 to 26. 2 Timothy 2, verses 20 to 26. And in this incredible paragraph, we, we find ourselves diving into the middle of an argument. So we're going to have to do a little bit of contextual work before we really get running through this paragraph. But it won't take much time because it's a pretty familiar paragraph to many of you. Um, but it's also a very straightforward paragraph as well. So if, if you're not familiar with this chapter, uh, it won't take us much time to get up to speed. But we do have to pay attention to the context. But I want to just for a second show you why this text is so critical for our understanding of our usefulness to the Lord, our usefulness in the Lord's hands. And that comes from verse 21. Let's pick it up in verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. And I remember reading that very verse and the word, feeling like the words jumped off of the page at me, giving me assurance and encouragement and hope about usefulness to the Lord. Suddenly, my fears about being useful vanished because I realized, well, all usefulness is wrapped up right here in this verse, being a vessel for honor, set apart, sanctified, made holy, distinct from anything impure and unclean, and then I will be useful to the master, and I will be prepared for every good work. I cannot improve on that. There is no more usefulness than whatever the Lord would want to do with us. Christian, you are 
no more useful than you are holy. It doesn't matter if we're talking about parenting or if we're talking about your employment or if we're talking about your contribution to the church or your discipleship or anything in life. You cannot make yourself more holy. God alone can, and he chooses to use holy vessels. You can't improve your usefulness. You can't grow your usefulness. You and I only have the ability to hinder our usefulness. When it comes to usefulness, I'm a liability. When it comes to uselessness, I got that wrapped up. That's the one area I have ability. And so, when it comes to our usefulness to the Lord, he calls us to get busy pursuing holiness. Well, we are diving in, as I said, in the middle of a paragraph, so with that caution. We're going to go ahead and read the paragraph, because I don't want to, I don't, I'm not going to read the previous paragraph. We'll, we'll look at some details there. But understanding that I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit, nevertheless, I want this whole paragraph in your mind. So let's just follow along as we listen to Paul from verse 20 all the way down through 26. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. This paragraph starts most notably with this illustration of a house, a large house. And he picks a large house because there's going to be several vessels, enough of vessels of disparity so that he can prove the point and use the illustration. Now, the question then becomes, what house are we talking about? Why is Paul pointing to a house? And what does this house consist of? Like, is it, what does it represent? And some commentators even have, I've heard say, well, the house represents the world. And uh, in, the, in the world, Christians need to separate themselves from impure people. Well, that would just be a little bit short of the context. In the previous paragraph, it's very clear, as Paul is writing to Timothy about how to lead and shepherd the church of Ephesus, he's talking about church life and body life. And in fact, it, it should be very clear That by the time he gets to verse 16, he says, avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. I mean, he's not just sitting there saying, don't have a casual encounter with the cashier. He's talking about, don't let the casual conversation of vanity permeate the church, because that leads to further ungodliness. That kind of talk is going to drag down the quality of the body life inside the church. Verse 17, their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who have gone astray from the truth. He's clearly talking about men who were in the church and no longer are. They were manifest as heretics. They were perverting the church because of their false teaching. And so they've gone astray. They've actually denied the resurrection. They're ruining, overturning, upsetting the faith of some. And now verse 19, this becomes so, so critical for our paragraph. In verse 19, Paul says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal, quote, The Lord knows those who are his, end quote. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness, end quote. Now, this, these two quotes have caused some, con- some conversation, and they're not necessary Um, This is a pretty clear reference. The first phrase is word for word, straight out of the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Numbers 16, verse 5. The second quote has caused more conversation uh, among commentators, and that's probably because 
Um, what Paul is doing here is he's just giving a pretty literal translation of the original Hebrew in Numbers 16.26. Both of these references are pointing back to Numbers 16. If, you, if you're familiar with the book of Numbers, you're, you're, you might be familiar with what happens there. This is the story of Korah and the rebellion. And so let's just go, back, go there real quick. This is going to be important for us to understand the house, the house analogy. So Numbers chapter 16, I'm sorry, um, yeah, Numbers 16. So number 16, you've got Korah, his family, and they have a problem with Moses' leadership. The issue here is they are going against Moses. They are jealous of his influence and his leadership. And obviously, if you read the story, you realize Korah and all of his family are Israelites. They are in the people of God in an external sense. But they are clearly, clearly a threat to the spiritual holiness of these people. Verse 3, Korah and all of his family, they assembled against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You've gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And so he just says, Look, everyone's holy. Why do you think you're set apart? And Moses heard this, he fell on his face. And he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy, and will bring him near to himself, even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Now you think, wait a minute, I thought you said in 16.5 was the quote. And that's actually true. Um, in five, uh, at the beginning of the quote, Moses says, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his, and um, the Greek translation of showing who is his own is the Lord knows, he understands and knows those who are his. The Lord knows those who are his, and he'll show. So they go and bring their censers, and they lay down the incense the following day. And as you remember the story, um, he says, if these people die a natural death, then we are not called to lead the people, but if they die an unnatural death and you see something you've never seen before, then you know that God called us to lead. So verse 19, Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. In verse 21, this is what the Lord says, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. So Moses and Aaron are by themselves, and God's telling them, separate yourself from the entire congregation. I'm about to wreck shop on the entire nation. Verse 22, but they fell on their faces and said, oh God, God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, will you be angry with the entire congregation? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Datham, and Abiram. Then Moses went, arose and went to Datham and Abiram with the elders of Israel following him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. And that's where Paul's second quote is a pretty direct translation of the original Hebrew. Separate yourself from wickedness. And touch nothing that belongs to them, or you will be swept away in all their sin. And as you know how the story unfolds, they get back from the, the dwellings of Korah, Datham, and Abiram. They come out, in verse 27, stand in front of their tents along with their families. And then Moses tells them, this is how you'll know whether God sent me or not. And as soon as he finished speaking, that it's going to be something unnatural or natural. That's the test. The ground underneath them, verse 31, was split open. Verse 32, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. Separate from men of wickedness, I'll say. Don't touch anything that belongs to them. So now we understand what Paul is thinking. When, go back to 2 Timothy. 
when he writes this word picture of a large house. He's picturing the people of God. The house represents the church, the church at Ephesus, the church at Corinth, the church at in Tempe, the church wherever the church of Christ is established, wherever it meets, this is a picture of the church. And he's alluding to the fact that the assembly of God's people back in that day was impure, and the exhortation was, separate yourself from wicked men. And so, this large house becomes the illustration. It's a full panoply of vessels and utensils that would exist in a large house. And so the house represents the church. Some profess Christ but propagate error. Some articulate truth accurately but live impure lives. And that's why Paul even compares the influence of these men to gangrene back in verses 16 to 19. Because he says that it's going to spread. It's going to be a gangrenous infection. And so, just like gangrene in the ankle, you don't, worry, you don't, you don't act like it's no big deal. You, you say, we've got to treat it, or we're going to end up amputating, or it's, take, it's killing the entire person. The whole body is ruined by the gangrenous infection. And so, Paul is telling Timothy, you understand the threat here. And so, he picks out this house, and he starts to point out, look, in a, in a large house, you've got gold vessels, you've got silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware. And obviously, you know what gold and silver are. That's precious metals. Wood is, you know what wood is. Earthenware, terracotta. It's like, you think, a clay pot. The, the wood and the, the terracotta is disposable. It's the cheaper variety. It's the stuff that you use that's not to, to intended to last. I remember as a kid growing up, um, special meals, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, maybe a, a, a family coming into town for a really nice dinner, and mom would break out this this like this box. It's hinged, and it, I mean, it looks like something out of a spy movie. You open it up, and you expect to see a million dollars of unmarked bills or something in there, and you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. You open up this box, and it's velvet lined, and it has all of this really fancy silverware in there. And she would break out the silverware and the nice china for a really really nice meal. I also remember growing up. And uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is maybe how you grew up, but the way I grew up, we, we grew up on um, a couple acres in uh, the Midwest, in the middle of Kansas, and we had uh, a dog, we had um, sheep, a goat, some chickens, and we had a lot going on in the back. And if we would go out and play, we occasionally might step in something that you know, was graciously donated to our property by some of the animals. And if we came in for dinner with some of these um, tokens of their appreciation, on our feet, we had to go take our shoes off outside and then go get the knife. Not just any knife, but not a knife out of the drawer, the knife that was kept under the sink by the back door. It's the knife for this purpose and this purpose only, to go clean up your shoes, uh, and then you can leave them out there and let them dry and then clean them up, you know, hose them off or whatever you needed to do. Obviously, you can see the importance of not mixing up the two. <laughs> I think the illustration is self-explanatory. Let's look at verse 21. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. The therefore shows us that Paul is obviously making a logical deduction from his illustration. I mean, we understand the gold and the silver, we understand the, the terracotta, the wood, we understand disposable vessels, we understand the difference between ornate furnishings like china or something that's, that's a vile and ignoble like a bedpan, and we understand there's a radical difference between the two, and those two must be kept distinct. Now, to make the point clear, when you're talking about the church, if you are going to be sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work, a vessel for honor, you are obligated to separate yourself from the things that are unclean. In any church, there's clean and unclean. And we have to separate ourselves. If 
anyone cleanses himself. This is, a, this is an exhortation. It's not a direct command. It's just a condition. But he's saying, if you cleanse yourself from these things, this is the result. So it's clearly an exhortation practically because he's telling his, uh, Timothy, look, for your people, you need to understand that your usefulness is contingent upon your holiness. So therefore, you must cleanse yourself. If anyone does, this is the result. Think about it, saints. There, there's no camaraderie between the useful vessel and the shameful vessel. They don't share anything. They don't fellowship together. They don't partner together. You don't put the knife that goes under the, 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 the sink in the back with the fine china. You don't mix the two. There's no partnership between true believers and the false professors. They don't share anything essential. They don't share anything integral except that they happen to maybe sit under the same sermon on Sunday morning. But when it comes to the heart, they live with different principles. They live with different purposes. They have a different agenda. They are worshiping something else. The true Christian has to separate himself. And yet, I just, I always marvel at times when I see somebody who is in the church and they just won't separate themselves from somebody who claims to be a Christian and they live patently unchristian lives. Why do we do that? And the excuses are manifold. Someone has to befriend them. I'm having an influ influence on them. Lifestyle evangelism. However, Paul here is telling Timothy that the only influence that matters comes from the Lord. The only influence that matters comes from the Lord. If you really care about somebody who's living an impure life or preaching impure doctrine, if you truly care about them, your greatest influence is to obey this verse. You cannot make yourself more influential than Christ would. He's going to use a holy vessel, to act like there's fellowship, to act like there's camaraderie, in order of hopefully at some point in the future, having some sort of man-made influence is not the kind of influence that Paul is after. When it comes to influence, just mark it, mark it down in your minds, you cannot produce more influence than God. And all the compromising approaches to influence fall short of or go beyond just simply being a pure, holy vessel. And any time we imagine that we can produce more influence by any other means than just obeying this passage, then we are actually arrogant. Because at that point, we think that we, can, we have a better way for influence. We know better how to influence. Or we have innate ability to influence. The Bible has a word for that, and it's, it's arrogance. Psalm 119, verse 21 says, You rebuke the arrogant, those who wander or go astray from your commands. Divine influence is always through a holy instrument. If we think about influence from verses 20 and 21, it's very clear our influence is our holiness. And so when it comes to innate lack of influence, if we simply resign ourselves to this verse, by obeying the Lord, our lack of influence becomes God's influence. By pursuing holiness, our mental limitation becomes a vehicle for divine wisdom. Our weakness or strength becomes a vehicle for divine power. And we become as influential as God wants us to be, as influential as he chooses to make us. Now, the rest of this paragraph starts to unfold pretty quickly. Usefulness to the Lord requires sanctification. It requires holiness. Our, 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 our holiness is our usefulness. But what Paul does is he starts to boil it down in three specific areas. And so here's what I'm going to do is as we work through verses 22 to 26, let me show you these three areas where he starts to highlight how important it is for our holiness to permeate who we are and what we do. First of all, in verse 22, 
just simply at the level of character. And this is where it all starts, at the level of character. Verse 22, now, flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Now, there are three conjunctions here, um, and they come in verse 22, 23, and 24. And it's interesting, in verse 22, in the NAS, it's translated now. In 23, it's translated but. In 24, it's not even translated. Uh, But those three conjunctions mark out very clearly what Paul is doing with his exhortation about our usefulness being tied to our holiness. And so, taking them one at a time, verse 22 is about character. Character. And he starts by just telling us, flee youthful lusts. What a very appropriate exhortation to Timothy, who would have been a young man, probably in his 30s, if you do the timeline of how long he'd been following uh, Paul's ministry. Um, And he talks about that later in the letter, his example, um, especially from chapter 3, verses 10 to 14. He starts pointing back to even his first missionary journey. Uh, So all the way through the middle portion of the book of Acts, Timothy has been shadowing Paul. And so he's talking to this young uh, man. Paul's a mentor to this young man. And, 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 And Timothy is now being exhorted, flee youthful lusts. Flee youthful lusts, Timothy. Now, the first thing that comes to mind when I say the word lust is probably sexual. And that's very, very important, and that that applies very directly to this exhortation. Because if we don't flee sexual lusts, we are absolutely useless. And let me show you real quick a quick cross-reference. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and I know this is familiar to, to, to many of you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Here's God's will for your life. You know, when we talk about God's will, and you can just go to the passages and say, here's God's will. God's will is that you give thanks in all things. God's will is that you pray continually. And here is another one. God's will is your holiness. Your holiness. Verse 3. For this is the will of God. Here it is. Your sanctification. How simple is that? What's God's will for you? Your holiness. Your sanctification. Well, what do you mean by that? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Let me give you three um, definitions expansive statements about what it means to be holy in this context. First of all, that is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Secondly, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, which is a powerful way to say when you are sexually impure, or when you don't possess your body in an honorable, dignified way, you are never more like the atheist. And third, verse 6, that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we told you before and solemnly warned you. And and again, you know, that people have debated that, but I believe the issue here with defrauding your brother goes back to the Old Testament Torah, when if you sinned with a a woman, there's actually a a liability to a future uh, potential mate, a brother in the nation of Israel, and that's even the way it's worded in the Torah. So here, Paul just points out, don't tra- transgress and defraud your brother in the matter be- by, by, by not being pure. 4, verse 7, God has called us not for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. I mean, you think about it. Imagine if if you're eager to be useful to the Lord. You're eager to be useful, to be what he wants you to be. Uh, You want to have influence. You want to serve. You want to be fruitful. But you don't have a pure life. You are rejecting the Holy Spirit. You're you're denying God. You're You're not rejecting Paul. You're not rejecting your pastor. You're rejecting the God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. There's no more influence than what the Spirit would produce in you and through you. So now go back to 2 Timothy, and you understand this is, uh, makes perfect sense. Timothy, you know, if you want to be useful, then you have got to forsake youthful lusts. 2 Timothy 2.22. But he doesn't just stop there. It's not just what he needs to forsake. It's not just what he needs to flee. It's also what he needs to pursue. So flee youthful lusts. And by by the way, I did want to emphasize uh, the First Thessalonians four type of context. But I would also say it's any desire, strong desire that is um, descriptive of young men. 
It could be sexual, it could be ambition, it could be preeminence, it could be comfort, it could be whatever, fill in the blank that characterizes young men, and that's exactly what Timothy must flee. And knowing that you cannot exist in an ambition vacuum, he says, here's what you should pursue. Here's what you should be after. This is what you should be focused on. Flee those things, but pursue five five things. Righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So there's this corporate pure heart congregation element, and if you are pursuing those other qualities, then you will have camaraderie with those who also call on the Lord from a pure heart. Pursue righteousness. Pursue what is upright. Pursue what God's called you to pursue. And again, he's not just talking about pursuing the righteousness given to you at justification. He's talking about practically. Timothy has already believed. Timothy is a believer. He's already been declared righteous. He's called to pursue practical righteousness. He's called to pursue faith. And again, it's not that he's never believed. He believes the gospel. But that's an ongoing, that's the calling of a Christian to keep pursuing faith, to continue to refuse to listen to my own thinking and to keep thinking God's thoughts, believing God's thoughts, standing on God's thoughts, acting on God's thoughts, living by faith even when it doesn't make sense to take God at his word. Keep pursuing that. Pursue love. Pursue what's best for the people around you. Pursue peace. Pursue what what makes for strong bonds among those who have pure hearts. That's what you pursue. And this is the character of a man or a woman who is useful. we got to move on to point two, but I do want to show you something. This is such a powerful passage, just these three verses alone, and I like to think that David wrote an Old Testament parallel to this. Let me show it to you. Turn back to Psalm 101. And look at David. I mean, Paul's just plagiarizing David here at this point. Look at what David writes in Psalm 101. Talk about forsaking the unclean vessels and talk about pursuing righteousness and purity and love and faith with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's exactly what he does in this psalm. In verses 1 through 5, he forsakes the unclean vessels, and then in verse 6 6 through 8, the second stanza, he actually pursues those virtues with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Verse 1, I will sing of loving kindness and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praises. I will give heed to the blameless way. When will you come to me? I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. I hate those who fall away from the Lord. I hate those who apostatize from the redemptive promises that have been given to the nation of Israel. It shall not fasten its grip on me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will know no evil. So it doesn't matter if it's talking about an evil person or an evil thought. I'm, gonna have, I'm not going to tolerate vain thoughts in my mind. I'm not going to hang out with vain people who are apostatizing from truth. Verse 5, whoever secretly slanders his neighbor, him I will destroy. I mean, David is not neutral about unbelief. He is not neutral about unclean vessels. He says, I will destroy that individual. Wow. 5b, no one who has a haughty look and an arrogant heart will I endure. I mean, that's not unloving. That's loving. Sorry, friend. You keep saying you love the promises of God and you keep denying it by your lips or you keep denying it by your life, I don't have time for that. We don't have fellowship, friend. But positively, here's where he goes, verses 6 through 8. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a blameless way is the one who will minister to me. He who practices deceit shall not dwell within my house. He who speaks falsehood shall not maintain his position before me. Every morning I will destroy all the wicked of the land so as to cut off from the city of the Lord all those who do iniquity. And he, keeps, he goes right back into who he's going to dis, disassociate with, but he begins right there with this positive of, I am actually going to be 
avoiding the negative, but looking out for the faithful, watching out for those who have blamelessness, looking for those who have integrity, looking for those who are loyal to the Lord, looking for those who believe the truth and walk in it. That's who I set my eyes on. That's who I spend my time with. That's who I have my fellowship with. Psalm 101 is really an Old Testament parallel here to 2 Timothy 2.20 and following. And so in 22, it starts with character. Usefulness to the Lord requires holiness, and your usefulness is your holiness, and that starts with character. You can be no more useful to the Lord than you are holy in your character. And then secondly, in verse 23, he moves on to another topic here, and I called it the content. It's your message. It's what you say. It's what you speak. It starts with character, and then it also includes content, your message, your speech, what you actually are telling people, what you are declaring. In verse 23, Paul says, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Now that's interesting, because now Paul is telling Timothy that there's something he has to reject, he has to absolutely refuse. And it really does seem like it's one of Satan's greatest tactics in the church to lull Christians to sleep and um, for them to lose clarity. Uh, one of his greatest tactics has to be what he describes here in verse 23, and that is foolish and ignorant speculations. This is the, the kind of thinking, the kind of axiom, the kind of thought that actually has a ring of religious truth to it, but it's actually ultimately man-made. It's ultimately human philosophy. It's ultimately human wisdom. And these two words here, the word foolish is the Greek word moros, where we get our word moron, and the word translated ignorant means unlearned or uneducated. And so he uses these adjectives to describe the thinking, literally speculations. This is the investigation, the controversy, the questioning, the line of reasoning. It's how we think about something. And he says, look, you shouldn't even be tolerating foolish, ignorant lines of reasoning in the church. That shouldn't even be tolerated. Now, well, I know we've got our, our older, our older uh, kids here, so I guess everybody from sixth grade up, you know, you guys are uh, you're listening to this, and, and I'm about to break a rule. That some, some of your parents have a good rule in your house, and you don't use a word, you don't call people stupid, okay? And that's a great rule. You don't call people stupid. Your parents are not my parents. <laughs> and I'm going to say, I'm just going to say, this Word is very appropriate for verse 23. Paul is warning Timothy about stupid thinking. Anytime man comes into the church and starts talking about truth and speaking something to a fellow brother or sister in Christ, and he's speaking something that rooted, is rooted in him, that is stupid. That is folly. That cannot be tolerated. And these adjectives show that the person who's thinking these thoughts has exalted human wisdom and is actually unimpressed with divine wisdom anymore. They, 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 have, they have not, they've ceased to become impressed with the mind of God. They have since become impressed with their own mind. And it's just like Jesus said, you'll know them by how they speak. If you are seeking the glory of God, you speak. Speak his words. If you're seeking your own glory, you speak from yourself. That's just that easy. And so people have their own message. They're bored with the message of God. People stick to what the text says. They're impressed with what God says. It's just that easy. And so here he is in verse 23 saying, that's just stupid. Stupid speculations, a stupid reasoning process rooted in arrogance. And so have nothing to do. Refuse, reject. This does not mean just smile politely and say, hey, pass the creamer. It doesn't mean change the topic. It means reject, have nothing to do, disassociate with, distance yourself from it. Why? Because you know that it produces quarrels. This does not promote faith. This does not promote conviction. It just promotes quarrels, arrogant men arguing over their own stupid ideas. I wrote out a list of the way we're supposed to respond to people and to teaching from the pastorals, and the pastorals are full of these kind of instructions, and this might be this might be heavy hitting. Some of you are maybe newer to the church. You realize, whoa, this is, man, this is intense. This is an intense line being drawn in the sand here. If you're saying, if, if Paul's right, that means we have to draw lines in the sand sometimes about 
ideas that would affect how we live, how we relate to one another, how we think about the gospel, and how we think about the glory of God, and we actually have to decipher whether it's true or not, and then reject some of them and embrace others. Yes. Think This is all over the pastorals. Think about what, God, what, what Paul tells Timothy and Titus about people who need to be reproved and who need to be instructed because they oppose the faith. Titus 1, verse 13 is one such example. Titus 1, 13, Paul says, um, well, verse 12, he says that uh, a prophet of the, from Crete said, and this is earlier, I mean, centuries before, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Verse 13 says, this is true. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith reprove severely. That means to expose the nature of their error, correct them, and give them a path back to righteousness and back to the truth. 2 Timothy 2.25, we'll get to in just a second. It's another example. Think about how Paul tells uh, Titus to refuse association with those who threaten church unity because they don't respond to such reproof. Later in, the, in Titus, Titus chapter 3, verse 10, Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted, his soul is twisted and perverted, and he is sinning, being self-condemned. He condemns himself because of his dissentiousness and his factiousness. He is not interested in truth, and he's not interested in peace or unity. Think about Paul's exhortation about teaching. He says in the uh, beginning of 1 Timothy, he says that there's going to be false teaching that, that is, is creeping in, and it's not false because it's patently heretical. It's false just because it's not in the Bible. Think about this for a second. The church cannot even tolerate mess- a message that is not just because it denies the truth, but simply because it, it isn't the truth. So it's one thing to categorically deny the truth by way of some sort of obvious heresy. It's another thing for a message to just simply be biblical. It's just, it's not wrong, it's just not biblical. That's what Paul tells Timothy about at the beginning of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 through 7, he says, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. The... the, the the, 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 command, the command here is, is instruct certain men, command, demand certain men to not be teaching. And when it says strange doctrines, it's literally in the Greek, just other doctrines. It's not that they're crazy, kooky, you know, some sort of thing you watch on some late night documentary. It's not, it's not that it's strange in some sort of eccentric way. It's strange because it's just different than the Bible. It's different than the truth. And so this isn't, we, don't, we, we, shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have toleration for a message that's heretical, of course, but the point is, is it goes much farther than that. We shouldn't have tolerance for other doctrines. And so Paul tells Titus in chapter 1, verse 9, that the qualifications of an elder is that he has to be able to accurately handle God's word, exhorting in sound doctrine and reproving those who oppose. Jude says that he had to write to contend for the faith because it was being twisted and perverted by men who were libertarian in their theology, turning the grace of God into an excuse for living how they want to live. The church has always been under assault. The church has always been assaulted by um, foolish and ignorant speculations, and it's not enough to ignore them. We have to act categorically reject them. Picture this for a second. When we think about correcting the truth, you might be a little intimidated. You're like, oh man, woof, what does that mean? Well, for every uh, member here, we've got some notable heretics for you out back. I'm gonna, after I dismiss, you can go out there and you're going to refute them. We're going to grade you on how you do. And No, what does that, what does that mean? I mean, like, what, what are you called to do? Well, well, remember, Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy's a pastor. That is an, that is an elder function to refute those who contradict, exhort, and sound doctrine, the positive and the negative. That's, that's an elder function. But I would say it this way, that it's an elder function to be exemplary in, to model it for everyone else. We should all want to uh, obey this verse in, in the way that God has called us to, but of course we all have to grow in it. Let me give you some encouragement to think about this. Picture how useless it would be to confront, if you heard in the church, if you heard somebody who professes Christ in the church, and they start spouting out a message that's rooted in their own experience, imagine how futile it would be to refute their experience with your experience. 
Well, that's your experience, but this is my experience. Imagine if you heard somebody in the church starting to spout a message, and it was rooted in their own reasoning, and so you rebut it with your own reasoning. Well, that's your thinking. Here's my thinking. Just man versus man, and you just created a quarrel. Or imagine if it's just speculation. You're hearing somebody, and you're thinking, like, well, that's what he's imagining. You know, the way I've always imagined it is this. (laughs) And then you just pick the fight. It leads to further quarreling, fights that promote contention, uh, come from arguments based on personal authority. And that's what quarreling is all about. It's all about personal authority. It's all about um, what I get out of it and feeling superior. The issue is, are we speaking truth to reject and silence these foolish and ignorant speculations? Here's, here's the way I would summarize it. Contention rises from personal speculation, but conviction rises from divine revelation. That's how we have to think about it in verse 23. The last area here, verses 24 to 26, conversation. Conversation, or you could use the word interaction, or you could use the word relationship, or how we relate to one another. This is, this is really an area where our holiness is going to show itself. And notice that the first area is character. The second area is your message. So now in the third area, it becomes relationship because that's the combination of your character and your message on display in relationship with someone else. So it's actually a very logical flow here of where he's highlighting the importance of holiness. Verse 23, the Lord's bondservant, the Lord's slave. This refers to the Christian, and especially Timothy as a pastor, as someone who does not have a will of his own. His will is subject to God's will. That's all that matters. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Here's God's will, is that I would not be quarrelsome, that we wouldn't be arguing and bickering about personal uh, argument, personal authority, personal speculations, personal ambitions, personal imaginations, or personal reasonings, that we would actually be devoted to the truth so that we would no longer be quarrelsome. But kind to all, kind to all. I mean, if you are actually interested in declaring divine revelation, then even with somebody who opposes the truth, hates Jesus Christ, and poses a threat to your local assembly, you still have the privilege of being kind. You still have the privilege of being kind to them. And I would say that in verse 24, all of these could apply even inside the church. And again, I think the whole passage applies to those who are inside the church. But especially in verse 24, Five, he makes it explicit to those who are in opposition to the truth, which was happening inside the church. But even in verse 24, this becomes extremely helpful for us to think about even believers who are walking with the Lord. Are we quarrelsome? Are we kind to all? Able to teach? Patient when wronged? If you're standing on the truth, you have nothing to be scared of. You have nothing to hide. There's nothing to protect. There's peace. There's confidence and there's calmness. There's just a delight to be able to love on a friend and articulate truth. If you profess Christ and imagine trying to share the gospel with an unbeliever who is notably wrong, of course they're wrong. What else can they be but wrong? You think about unsaved family members. You think about friends who you've been sharing the gospel with for a long time. You think, but they're wrong. And they need to see how illogical they're being. Well, do they? Is their problem their lack of logic? Nope. Look at where Paul goes. Verse 25, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. With gentleness. Meekness. Jesus was called meek. The most powerful human being to ever walk this earth was meek. Meekness has been defined as power under control. You might be able to annihilate an unbeliever's intellectual argument. Who cares? What does that matter? That is not their need. All that is is a matter of pride. With gentleness, what they need is correction. They need gentle correction. Correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. You know this. You know that faith is a gift of God, for God has been granted to you not only to believe but also to suffer in his name, Philippians 1.29. Faith and suffering are granted from God. It's a gift of God. You know Acts 5, God granted repentance to 
the Jews. Acts 11, he granted repentance to the Gentiles. And so now here Paul is telling Timothy, why don't you try, you, 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 must, be, you must not be quarrelsome, just try that out, Timothy. And just be kind to all, teach them, even if they wrong you, just be patient. And then when you simply hold forth truth with gentleness, that might be the means of God granting them repentance. See, what they need is not exposure of the illogical nature of their argument. They need supernaturally enabled repentance. You think, but what if I don't even get to share the gospel that way? Isn't that in the Lord's hands? Can you, can you really incre increase God's influence? Can you create influence when God hasn't given it to you? I remember a, a man called, called the church that I was serving at before this church, and um, I'd never met him before. I just got the my secretary and said, hey, there's somebody calling for need, need a pastor. So I didn't know what it was, a crisis or what. So I get this, this man, this man named Nelson, picks up, you know, responds on the other line. He just says, says hey, I want to talk to you. I'm like, oh, hey, we're, uh, tell me your name. He's like, my name's Nelson. Uh, really unfriendly, kind of, kind of abrupt and blunt. And uh, I'm like, hmm, I wonder where this is going. And I said, hey, Nelson, where are you calling me from? Where do you live? He's like, I'm on lunch break. Okay. So we proceeded to talk about the Trinity and why I was a heretic. It took him all of about eight seconds to get there. And um, it, was, it was fascinating as I heard him and I listened to him for a few minutes. And then I started to respond, and I could never get more than two or three sentences out without him interrupting me. And so after about the third interruption, I just said, Hey, Nelson, look, I am really glad to take some time and help you out. I would love to be a help to you. I'd love to answer your questions. I'd love to do that, but you keep interrupting me, and we're not even able to talk about the truth here. And so I'm going to need to just, I'm gonna need you to just hear me out. I, I understand where you're coming from. I think this is your concern, and we started from there, and sure enough, he just kept interrupting me, and so I just kept talking, speaking truth, and he finally hung up on me, <laughs> and I finally got back to work. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like that, though, doesn't it? You're like, but, but if I just obey, it might just be a waste of time. It might be useless. No, it's never useless. You cannot increase your usefulness except just simply obeying. Here was a situation where it required patience, it required biblical instruction, but no instruction was possible. And that was, that was a divine victory. That wasn't a waste of time. That was a divine victory. God doesn't need me to talk to that man to save him. He wanted to produce more holiness. Verse 26, Paul explains not just that God would grant them to repentance, but here's the nature of it, why God has to grant them, because in verse 26 he says, and that they may come to their senses. That's a word that means to be sobered up. This is the only time it's used in the New Testament, and it means to be sobered up again, to come to your senses. And so it's kind of picturing the dominion of Satan over unbelievers as an inebriation. And so it says that they may come to their senses, they may be sobered up again, and escape from the snare of the devil. And, and that means, here it's described as being held captive by him to do his will. And that word held captive means to be captured alive. So the, the sons of disobedience are captured alive, enslaved, in a cage, unwilling to do anything except what Satan wants them to do, which is, not surprisingly, also what we in our sin want to do. We are enslaved to our own fallen will. We're enslaved to Satan's will. The only way out is that God would grant repentance through the articulation of truth, through a holy vessel. It kind of puts it into perspective, doesn't it? As we think about our usefulness, we can't improve. John the Baptist said in John 3, 27, his disciples came to him and said, hey, John, Jesus' disciples, are, you know, they're, they're, Jesus is discipling more people than you are. He's, he's baptizing way more. Influence has teetered from you now over to Jesus. And you remember the famous statement in verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. But before he said that, remember what he said in 27? A man can receive nothing unless it's given to him from heaven. Isn't that helpful? Isn't that helpful? That's liberating. What makes for usefulness? Strength? Power or influence? Intellect? Ability or gifting? Experience? 
No. No, 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 no. When it comes to our spiritual usefulness, we have no ability to produce fruit on our own, let alone make ourselves more useful. So what's hopeful about this text is that when it comes to influence in this church, influence in our homes, influence with professing Christians who are maybe opposing or notable heretics in the church or even the unbeliever who just has pagan integrity, in all of those circles, your innate lack of influence becomes the means of divine influence. Your weakness becomes divine power working through you, and your intellectual limitation becomes divine wisdom working through you. If we pursue holiness, we become as useful as God wants to make us, which is beyond anything we could have ever asked. Lord, we're so grateful for this text and so thankful for the encouragement. I pray that this morning, Lord, it becomes an encouragement for all of us as we think about serving in your church and as we think about usefulness and even being equipped for every good deed. Lord, I know that it's very easy at times to think that there might be something lacking um, by way of equipping or circumstantially that would really be the hindrance, the notable, the notable um, pr uh, prevention for influence that, that, that you would want. And Lord, we know that none of that is, is the issue. The issue is notably our holiness. And so, Lord, we long to be sanctified, set apart. We long to cleanse ourselves from everything impure. We long to see every impure motive and every impure desire. And even when the good and right desire for um, usefulness in your hands becomes something uh, of personal significance, we want to be, we want to cleanse ourselves from that so that we would have nothing left but simply the thrill of being like your son. Lord, the privilege of being made like Christ is the path to the greatest influence we could ever have and the greatest usefulness we could ever have. And, and so, Lord, in this short life that you've given to us, we do not want to get in the way. We know that naturally we could hinder the, influence, the, the usefulness and the influence that you would, would give. But, Lord, there's, there's no usefulness um, with these things in our in our character, in our content, or in our conversation. And so I just pray that you would purify us so that you could do exactly what you want as we sit comfortably in your hands as a holy, a pure, righteous, broken, humble vessel. In your name we pray. Amen.